Coming up on State of Events, two escaped prison inmates were finally captured last week near the Mexican border. And we will take you through the election results to see what has changed locally and nationally. And State of Events starts now. Welcome to State of Events. I'm David Fuentes. And I'm Natasha Casino. Let's get down to our top story for this week. The United Nations General Assembly voted for the 28th consecutive year to condemn the 57-year-old U.S. trade embargo against Cuba. The final vote was 187 to 3, with the United States, Israel, and Brazil voting no, while Colombia and Ukraine abstained. And for the second year, Moldova did not vote. In a Twitter statement on November 4th, Cuba's foreign minister, Bruno Rodriguez accused the Trump administration of exercising severe pressures on six Latin American nations to vote against the rebellion. Cuba, he said, will not cease demanding the total elimination of economic, commercial, and financial blockade imposed by the United States. Last week, the United States held local and state legislative elections across various states. And while the Bay Area voted on key decisions, it was the results in Virginia and Kentucky that may have a significant impact on the 2020 general elections. For the first time in over two decades, Democrats took full control of the Virginia state legislature last Tuesday. With all 140 Senate seats up for grabs on election day, voters were able to flip six seats in the House of Delegates and two seats in the state Senate bringing Democrats to a majority. This is important to the state because Democrats will now be able to effectively put forth legislation emphasizing gun control and expansions to public health care, things Republicans have been reluctant to do so in Virginia and across the nation. And in Kentucky's race for governor, underdog Andy Deshear was able to defeat incumbent Republican Governor Matt Bevin, who President Trump attended a rally for prior to Election Day in an attempt to appeal to Republican voters. The president's rally efforts were to no avail, and Democrats are hopeful the election results in Virginia and Kentucky may signify a wave of blue in the coming 2020 general election. Local elections also happened last week. Chesa Boudin appears to have the votes to take office as district attorney, although official votes are still uh, being counted. Boudin beat out incumbent Susie Loftus by just over 2,000 votes. Absentee ballots, however, are still being accounted for. Dean Preston has claimed victory over incumbent Valley Brown for supervisor, of for supervisor of District 5. Brown received 67 more first place votes than Preston. However, Preston received far more second place votes and is expected to win the election. The official outcome is yet to be announced. Several propositions were also voted on. Prop A, a bond for affordable housing. Prop A has 71% yes vote, while Prop D has just over 67% approval. While the polls have been tallied, there are still thousands of provisional ballots to be counted for. Despite that fact, most of the other races have been determined. London Breed will remain the mayor with over 70% of the vote. Prop C, which was intended to repeal the city's ban on e-cigarettes, failed to pass by a wide margin, and all other propositions on the ballot passed easily. This week, lawmakers will begin to hold public impeachment hearings as the impeachment process continues to unfold. Jordan Myers has the latest on what's to come this week. This Wednesday will mark the first of many publicly held testimonies. For news audiences, these hearings will be a third round of accounts from key witnesses. The first being leaked and preliminary accounts of testimonies given behind closed doors to investigators. The second being the recently released transcripts of the witnesses' depositions. On Wednesday, the hearings are expected to begin with the acting ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor, followed by the senior deputy assistant secretary, George Kent. Then, on Friday, the former ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, is also expected to testify. All three witnesses have already given investigators potentially damaging information against President Donald Trump. Many Republicans are still standing behind the president, saying, this is nothing more than hearsay. Did he talk to the president? He talked to Ambassador Sondland, who talked to the president. Oh, that's hearsay. Over the next coming weeks, we can expect more political bickering from both sides of the aisle, while investigators determine whether or not there is sufficient evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. In San Francisco, I'm George Myers for State of Events. 
President Trump was ordered to pay $2 million to charities for misuse of the Trump Foundation. Trump admitted that his campaign was given complete control over $2.8 million raised at an event for veterans in 2016. Those funds were used for financial obligations of Trump's companies as well as personal use. Though admitting wrongdoing in court papers, Trump tweeted that the charity gave, quote, 100% of the funds to great charities. The two homicide suspects who escaped the Salinas prison last week were captured Wednesday early morning. Santos Fonseca and Jonathan Salazar were taken into custody near the Mexican border while attempting to re-enter the United States from Tijuana. The suspects escaped by opening up a small hole in the bathroom of their housing unit that was currently under construction. Both suspects were booked in 2018 for separate alleged homicides. Additional escape charges are expected, according to authorities. On Wednesday, the city of Las Vegas passed an ordinance which makes it illegal for homeless people to sleep on sidewalks. Many are calling the legislation a criminalization of homelessness, saying that it gives Las Vegas police just another reason to arrest vulnerable people. Las Vegas Mayor Caroline Goodman believes although the bill is flawed, it's a step in the right direction. There's so much to do, so this is just a first step, and that's why it's flawed, because it's not perfect. It is a resource and a model to get replicated in other parts of Clark County. The controversial ordinance is expected to be enforced beginning next February. It has been nearly a week since we have learned about the terrifying family massacre that happened in Sonora, Mexico. State of Events Jennifer Rios has the latest on this investigation. Just one week after an American family and their eight children were attacked while traveling between the desert of Chihuahua and Sonora, Mexico. Bienvenidos a Palispe, the closest city to where these attacks occurred. State military have been on high alert around the area covering their faces and affiliations. Here you see the exact location where the family murder took place, leaving behind the scene of the moment the family was attacked, where Renee Miller and her four children were shot and killed and were later burned inside their vehicle. The victims were dual U.S. and Mexican citizens from a Mormon community in Mexico. Authorities from the state of Mexico believe that the family was ambushed by a local cartel, but were mistaken for the rivalry cartel, since the area is only 100 miles out from the United States border, which is used to traffic drugs into the U.S. The family was believed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Local residents say they are surprised at the level of brutality they have seen against them and their neighbors, such as longtime resident Julian Lebron. Threatened, at least not in any way to suppose that uh, women and children would be murdered. Julian describes the moment he discovered one of the family members. Uh, and then she was just laying on the ground when we came on her, and I could tell that, you know, I could tell from the blood stains that they aimed, aimed for her heart. Family members of the family still have questions as to why this family was attacked, with longtime standing history of cartels in the country, which has now led to the deaths of a mother and her children. President of Mexico, Lopez Obrador, has said to have attempted to reduce the level of violence in the country, the primary aim for his presidency campaign. The murder rate is at an all-time high, roughly six times higher than the United States. The funeral services of the victims took place a few days after the murder as the surviving family members said their goodbyes as investigators are continuing to find out who is responsible for these gruesome murders. Reporting in San Francisco, I'm Jennifer Rios for State of Events. A new danger is becoming more apparent with the rapidly advancing consequences of climate change. With polar sea ice melting even faster than initial projections, global sea levels are expected to rise 2 meters by the end of the century. But that's not the only issue associated with this ice melt. For the first time in recent history, Pacific and Atlantic waters are beginning to be connected through channels in the North Pole, and deadly diseases are being spread through them between marine animals. One such disease called Phocine distemper virus, or PDV, is infecting seals and otters in the northern hemisphere, in some cases wiping out 50% of localized populations for these animals. While not contagious to humans, it has a direct impact on those who rely on these species for food and their economy. Change could be on the way for political ads on Facebook. Facebook is considering changes to its current policy on political ad advertisements. Facebook is exploring limiting how micro ads can be targeted, changing the design of ads so they are more prominently labeled, and include more information about political advertisers. Facebook has been most criticized for not fact-checking politicians. However, that policy was not listed among those being considered. Next on State of Events, China passes new laws to combat youth video game addiction. And then, as the end of the semester approaches, we take a look on how to deal with stress and anxiety during finals.
They say this is garbage. Useless. Out of style. They say that this is obsolete. Half forgotten, twice replaced, and then some. You are the re-originator. An innovator. The treasure hunter. Master of uncharted territories and pioneered ideas. A voyager. No doubts to break outside the boundaries. You have no boundaries. You have the power to shatter the mold. You. To reshape the rule. A new class. New norm. There is no norm. You're the breath of a new revolution. And they say that this is secondhand. Welcome back to State of Events. I had the opportunity to sit down with San Francisco State's newest president, Lynn Mahoney, as she gives an exclusive interview with State of Events on her vision for the university. Welcome to State of Events. I'm Natasha Casino, and today I have a very special guest, President Lynn Mahoney. Thank you so much for being here, President Mahoney. Thank you for having me. So first off, how are you doing today? I am doing great. Right. Um, it's, we've got a big event tonight celebrating our alumni. We're celebrating four distinguished alumni who will be uh, inducted into our Hall of Fame. So I just know there's something really special at the end of the day. That's fun. That's cool for uh, a Friday night, right? It's spectacular. What a great way to end the week. And include one of the folks that we're commemorating is one of our 1968 strikers. And so given that it's the 50th anniversary of the College of Ethnic Studies, it just seems perfect. That's awesome. So I'm sure the university wants to get to know their newest president a little bit better. Do you think you can tell us a little bit about yourself, your educational background, and just basically what your position as president entails? So I am a native New Yorker, grew up in New York City, and uh, came here to California for college. Had four great years here, but was dragged back east by a boyfriend whom I subsequently married, and we've been married for 31 years, so he dragged me away, but we came back. Mm -hmm. And in 2008, I was really fortunate to get a job at the California State University at Long Beach and discovered this spectacular educational system. I think it's the best system in the United States, if not the world, for providing access to students for whom college, and college education is transformative. Mm -hmm. And so I've spent the last 11 years working in the CSU, first for Long Beach, then for LA, and now as a university pre president at San Francisco State. So I became an administrator for one primary reason. It was to ensure that students, to help students meet their academic and career goals. Mm -hmm. and as a president, I get to actually work with a talented group of vice presidents and deans and associate vice presidents, faculty and staff, to help ensure that we all work together to help students achieve their outcomes. For the full interview and highlights from my sit down with President Mahoney, visit YouTube for the full interview and our social media page at SFSU State of Events for the highlights. Nearly two million pounds of chicken are being recalled for metal contamination. Simmons Prepared Foods recalled several chicken products that include ready to cook chicken wings, chicken legs, and whole chickens. The chicken products were shipped to eight states where the products were intended to be distributed to restaurants, schools, and hospitals. There are no reports of anyone getting sick. However, those who purchase the products are urged to throw them away. As the midterms are underway, State of Events' Jennifer Rios takes a closer look at stress among college students here on campus and what we as students should keep in mind during these stressful times, such as midterms. Jennifer Rios joins us live on Holloway Street at San Francisco State. Jennifer, how is it out there? Yeah, David, I'm standing right outside the Creative Arts Building as midterms are underway and students are on their way to actually their classes and even the library. Students looking a little overwhelmed, definitely focused. It's good to be aware around this time about stress and anxiety and just how can students maintain their stress levels and just how many students are affected by this. As a nation, we see the number of students battling stress and anxiety at a growing rate. In the U.S. alone, an assessment made by the American College Association looked into the influences that can affect a college student's academic success and lifestyle, which concluded that nearly 30% of students experience stress, while 21.8% of students experience anxiety, a combined percentage of over 50% that students will experience stress and anxiety during their time in college. For students, it is important to keep in mind those important tips and tools that we heard from counseling and psychological services counselor Brooke Adams how to recognize and maintain our stress and anxiety. Know your own triggers. Know what's overwhelming. Get to know your own tipping point. Know that if you are 
um, spending too much time maybe with friends and you need to study a little more or you're working too much is there any way you can recalibrate kind of reorient yourself to uh, your schedule another one would be taking your time through hard scenarios as best you can really kind of tracking things just the way you do throughout the semester when you first start a semester you look at the syllabus there's a lot that you you plan to do but you can't do it all in one day right so you map out and kind of time manage when am I going to start that paper okay I have four more I have a group project and again it's different for each individual so really kind of knowing yourself tracking um, how you're doing emotionally checking in with friends sometimes they'll point that out to you you seem really overwhelmed you seem more sad this week are you okay um, I really encourage students to look out for one another take care of each other and just a friendly reminder to students to take advantage of those services right here on campus at the Counseling and Psychological Services and the Health and Wellness Center right here on campus, including workshops, events, and private counseling sessions. Reporting live in San Francisco, I'm Jennifer Rios for State of Events. Last Thursday, China announced new regulations aimed to curb addiction to gaming among minors. The new guidelines are China's latest move in an ongoing campaign to increase regulation of the gaming industry. Under the new rules, gamers age under 18 will be banned from playing online games between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. on weekdays. Minors can only play for 90 minutes, and on weekends and public holidays, they may play up to three hours per day. The new measures also restrict how much money the minors can transfer to their online gaming accounts. Gamers age between 8 and 16 years old can only top up 200 yuan, $29, per month, while the maximum amount for those between 16 and 18 will be 400 yuan, or $57. The regulations are aimed at curbing video game addiction. China is the world's largest gaming market, accounting for a quarter of global revenue, according to market research firm Nuzu. The woman seen in a viral video taunting a lion at the Bronx Zoo has been arrested in New York. Maya Autry is charged with two counts of criminal trespassing. The 32-year-old turned herself in Wednesday night for the September 28th incident. Police say Autry shared videos of herself on social media, climbing over a wooden fence at the zoo, and then waving at lions. Investigators haven't said how she got over the barrier to, the, to face the lion, although Autry is accused of illegally entering the giraffe area. She wasn't hurt, nor were the animals, but zoo officials say her actions were extremely dangerous. More than 2,000 cases of vaping-related lung injuries have been reported in the U.S. 39 deaths have been confirmed. That's according to new numbers released Tuesday by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention known as the CDC. The outbreak has affected every state except Alaska. Young people make up the majority of those impacted. Among over 1,300 patients, 70% of the patients are male and 79% of the patients are under 35 years old. Health experts are warning the public to stop all e-cigarettes use as they continue to investigate exactly what's behind the illnesses and deaths. Most of the cases have been related to vaping products containing THC, the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. Next on State of Events, our entertainment correspondent fills us in on fashion's biggest night in 2020. And in sports, we take a look at the drama that unfolded last night at Levi Stadium that left the 49ers with their first loss.
Okay, that goes in the compost bin. Be sustainable. Be sustainable. Live sustainably. Welcome back to State of Events. Alondra Vega has the latest in entertainment news. Take it away, Alondra. Thanks, you guys. There's a lot to cover this week, so let's get right to it. Details about fashion's biggest night have finally been revealed. The Metropolitan Museum of Art revealed that the co-chairs for the 2020 Met Gala are Lin-Manuel Miranda, Meryl Streep, Emma Stone, and of course, Anna Wintour. This will be Meryl Streep's first time attending the Met Gala. For the theme next year, the theme is going to be called About Time, Fashion and Duration. According to Max Holling, the director of the Met, this exhibition will consider the ephemeral nature of fashion, employing flashbacks and fast forwards to reveal how it can be both linear and cyclical. In other words, the exhibition will look at what's old and what's new in fashion trends. The 2020 is going to be the biggest celebration for the Met because it celebrates its 150th anniversary. I bet you're wondering how much it costs to attend this celebrity prom and have your picture taken on the iconic staircase. The ticket to the Met costs about $30,000. The Met Gala will be on May 4th, 2020, and the exhibition will be on display from May 7th to September 7th, 2020. Last week, San Francisco State's Beckett Department hosted a symposium with writer and producer Kira Snyder. Snyder answered students' questions about what it takes to write and produce a television show and how the entertainment industry runs. Snyder is known for her works on The Handmaid's Tale, The 100, Pacific Rim Uprising, and Moonlight, the TV series. November is here, and so are the new movie releases. Here are the films you should be watching this month. Playing with Fire is a comedy starring John Cena and Keegan-Michael Key. The film tells the story of a team of first responders who rescue three kids. The firefighters learn that babysitting kids is just as intense as fighting with fire. Last Christmas is a rom-com set in London during the holiday season. Kate, a frustrated worker, falls for Tom's charms. The movie features numerous George Michael songs such as Faith and, of course, Last Christmas. The movie stars Amelia Clark and Henry Golding. Midway is a war movie set in World War II. The movie is based on true events, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the Battle of Midway. Movie stars Dennis Quaid, Darren Chris, and Nick Jonas appear in this movie. Harriet is a drama based on the inspiring life of Harriet Tubman. The movie tells the story of Tubman's escape from slavery to, and her cleverness to free slaves. The movie stars Cynthia Erivo as Harriet Tubman. Leslie Odom Jr. and Janelle Monet also star in the film. Goodbye pumpkin spice lattes and hello caramel brulees. The holiday season is back at Starbucks. The coffee chain released its holiday drinks and festive cups to the public this past week. You can sip a caramel brulee latte or a peppermint hot chocolate from the festive holiday cup. Starbucks also introduced a new holiday themed reusable red cup that says Merry Coffee. <coughs> Customers who bring the reusable holiday cup to Starbucks will get 50 cents off their holiday drink now until January 6. Great news for all of you millennial alternative music fans out there. Two bands have recently announced reunion tours set for 2020 and the internet blew up all over the hype. The first being the pop punk band My Chemical Romance who is coming back after a six-year hiatus. Their, after their split, the band members all enjoyed varied success on solo projects with lead singer Gerard Way, showing his talent for more than just music on his work, adapting the Umbrella Academy from a graphic novel to TV. The band took to Instagram to thank their fans after being surprised how warm of a welcome their comeback was received. The second band making their return to the stage is Rage Against the Machine after an image containing a list of tour dates was posted to Instagram on their newly created official band page. The image was of protesters in Chile and the same image without the tour dates was posted to Instagram by lead guitarist Tom Morello days earlier. And that's all I have for today's entertainment roundup. Back to you guys at the desk. So David, what's your favorite holiday drink? I don't know. I know eggnog is really popular, but I'm not too much of a fan. My mom makes this thing called champurado. It's kind of like a traditional Mexican holiday mm -hmm. drink. What about you? I definitely got to try that. Um, I'm personally a fan of Starbucks creme brulee latte. Oh, it's yeah. so good. I've heard about those. They're popular. <laughs> I have to try that too. 
Thanks, Alondra, for filling us in on what's going on in the entertainment world. In the sports corner, Graham Mukenfuss has some important news on, the Sa on San Francisco State sports and professional Bay Area, sport Bay Area sports. Take it away, Graham. Thanks, David. The men's soccer team are headed to the postseason. The CCAA championships begin this week, and SF State plays UC San Diego tonight in La Jolla. Unfortunately, the women's team failed to qualify for postseason this year. Their season concluded on Saturday. Women's volleyball won two out of their three games last week and have two road games this week before the CCAA tournament begins next week. They are currently second in their division. The Seahawks came into Levi Stadium last night and took the 49ers to the very end of overtime. 49ers took the lead early. They got out to a 10-0 lead on this pass from Jimmy Garoppolo to wide receiver Kendrick Bourne. And both defenses scored a touchdown in this one, including this fumble recovery by DeForest Buckner at a time when the 49ers desperately needed it, down 21-10. Seattle would pull ahead by a field goal with a minute 45 to play, but rookie kicker Chase McLaughlin hit a 47-yarder to send it to overtime. The Seahawks started a drive first in overtime, but Russell Wilson gets down to the red zone and throws a pick. The 49ers would come back and go for another 47-yarder from Chase McLaughlin. This time, though, not so lucky. Pulled this one wide to the left. The Seahawks would then drive down the field and kick a field goal to end it at the very end of overtime, ending the 49ers' perfect season. The Raiders' long-awaited return to Oakland was a triumphant one Thursday night. Chargers quarterback Phillip Rivers threw an interception on the first drive to Eric Harris, who would take it back to about the 30-yard line for the Raiders. They would eventually turn that into a field goal. So when the Chargers took the field on the next drive, Phillip Rivers to Eric Harris again. This time, Eric Harris took it all the way back for a Raiders touchdown. The game went back and forth, and the Chargers scored with under five minutes left to take the lead, but Raiders struck right back on this run from rookie Josh Jacobs. The Chargers would try to come back from that one, but Phillip Rivers once again throws an interception, giving the Raiders the 26-24 victory. The Utah Jazz were in town last night to take on the Warriors at Chase Center. Draymond Green was back in the lineup after a five-game absence, but he didn't make it through the entire game. He was ejected in the fourth quarter. D'Angelo Russell had 33 in this one. He came out blazing hot, scoring 18 points in the first quarter alone. Russell's effort wasn't enough though, and Rudy Gobert had 25 points and 14 rebounds as the Jazz won, 122 to 108. And finally, I want to show you my favorite play from last week, and we'll go to Cincinnati for this one. Lamar Jackson had four touchdowns, including this incredible 47-yard run. Kevin Harlan had the call on this. Oh, he broke his ankles. Now he's got an entourage, and he's got a touchdown. He is Houdini. What a play. 47-yard touchdown run by the magical quarterback, Lamar Jackson. It's just an incredible set of moves by Ravens quarterback, Lamar Jackson, who's an MVP candidate so far this season. Well, that does it for the sports wrap-up. Men's soccer plays tonight, volleyball plays Friday, and the Warriors are going to visit the Lakers tomorrow night. Back to you guys at the desk. That's all we have for this edition of State of Events. To stay up to date with all the news around San Francisco State, follow us on Twitter at state underscore of underscore events and check out our KSFS YouTube channel for State of Events. I'm Natasha Casino. And I'm David Fuentes. Be safe out there, Bay Area. Stay cool, San Francisco, and go Gators.